In the 1960s, Honda had become accustomed to winning on the racetrack and in the showroom. They were routinely claiming world championships and Isle of Man TT victories, while boasting the title of the world's biggest seller. By 1980, however, the competition was stronger and Honda's dominance had faded. Sometimes when this company has faced serious competitive threats in the past, they've mined the depths of their technical knowledge and creativity to come up with a product so innovative that it put them firmly back on top. This is the story about one of those products. In the early 1980s, some accused Honda of becoming too focused on their automotive products at the expense of their motorcycle lineup. And this was likely true, since their car sales were, by then, earning most of the company's revenue. Meanwhile, their competitors such as Yamaha, Suzuki and Kawasaki kept pushing forward with innovative motorcycles. All had double overhead cam inline fours for much of the 1970s, while Honda's big seller, the CB754, had a single overhead cam until its 11th year in 1979. The launch of Suzuki's Katana and Yamaha's V-Twin Virago in 1981 and anticipation around Yamaha's coming FJ1100 intensified the competition. Honda's mainstream bikes, although reliable and well-built, were losing ground. But what really woke up Honda executives was when Yamaha announced in 1980 that it had overtaken Honda in European sales and was about to do so in the US. Honda's upper management began discussing options to regain their market leadership. These discussions included Soichiro Honda himself, who had retired in 1973, but remained on board as a supreme advisor. Also in these discussions was Shoichiro Irimajiri, then managing director of Honda R&D. Irimajiri had also designed Honda's V12 Formula One engines and their successful five and six cylinder race bikes of the 1960s. After that, he oversaw the development of the first Goldwing prototype and the CBX-1000, to name just two. Irimajiri assembled a development team to work on the concepts for V-Twins that could be released in 1982 and 1983 to compete with Yamaha's successful Viragos. Months later, Honda's top management took a sudden turn and stopped the V-Twin project, instead directing Honda R&D to develop a new line of V4s. This decision was strategic, but also a matter of pride. Honda wanted to showcase their engineering capabilities, and with their advertising tagline at the time of, follow the leader, they couldn't just copy what others were doing. Project leader Iseo Yamanaka said the choice of V4 engines was driven by their distinct character and originality, because other manufacturers were focused on inline engines and V-twins. To market these new models, Honda wanted to demonstrate the potential of their V4 engines in the prestigious AMA Superbike series, which put a spotlight on big production sport bikes in the US market. Honda planned to enter its V4 in the series in 1983, which would be the first year of the series' new limit of 750 cc's, down from 1,000 cc's. Also starting in 1983, the series would only allow production bikes, usually defined as selling at least 5,000 worldwide. Honda needed its racer to be a production bike, a so-called homologation special. One factor favoring the V4 layout was the recent success of Honda's 150 horsepower FWS 1000 race bike, also known as the RS 1000 RW, or the Water Whale. It was built for the AMA Formula One series, the Daytona 200, and the Isle of Man TT. It had a 1024cc V4 liquid cooled four stroke with four valves per cylinder and gear driven cams. Mike Baldwin rode it to the AMA Formula One Championship in 1982. Many riders, mechanics and engineers on teams that ran the FWS 1000 recalled it as the best race bike they had ever worked with. It was fast, it handled well, it was easy to work on, and it had bulletproof reliability. Its only downside was that the racing tires of the day couldn't handle its power. In 1977, Honda announced their plan to return to Grand Prix racing, what's called MotoGP today, in 1979, after a 12-year hiatus. They introduced their 1979 Grand Prix contender, the NR500, 
At the same time, they unveiled the FWS 1000. NR stood for New Racing, Honda's Grand Prix team established in 1978. If nothing else, the NR500 was innovative. It had to be, because it had a 500cc 4-stroke V4 engine in a series increasingly dominated by 500cc 2-strokes. On paper, a 4-stroke would need to rev twice as fast as a 2-stroke of the same displacement to make the same power. But Honda took another route by doubling the number of valves to 8 per cylinder, using the extra space created by the radical choice of oval combustion chambers and oval pistons. Add a 23,000 RPM redline and you theoretically have a 4-stroke that should compete with 2-strokes. The NR500's design was rife with technical challenges and it took longer than other race bikes to reach its full potential. Unlike the FWS, the NR was a failure on the track, with its best result in three seasons being a 12th place finish by Takazumi Katayama at the 1980 West German Grand Prix. Honda's dream of beating two-stroke Grand Prix racers with a four-stroke had become a nightmare. So in 1982, they replaced the NR500 with the V3 two-stroke NS500, which won Freddie Spencer the World Championship in 1983. In 1984, they introduced the mighty V4 two-stroke NSR500, which would go on to win 10 World Championships from 1985 to 2001. So, on a one-year schedule, instead of the typical two years, Honda pulled out all the stops to begin development of their new line of production V4 bikes for introduction in 1982. The V45 Magna and Sabre models were prioritized for release that year because Honda expected their cruiser and upright styles to have a broader appeal in the US market. Soon the VF750F project also known as RC-15 and eventually marketed as the V45 Interceptor, was kicked off to build Honda's homologation special for the 1983 AMA Superbike series. As a V4 four-stroke, it would be derived from the V45 Sabre and the FWS 1000. Honda added recently retired AMA Superbike rider Mike Spencer to the project team in early 1982. Honda was building a racer that also needed to win in the showroom. They wanted it to have more power, delivered more smoothly than competing production and racing bikes. The big inline fours of the day were getting ever harder to control with their narrow power bands. The VF750F was given a 748cc liquid-cooled 90-degree V4. Like the FWS1000, the Interceptor's engine was solid mounted in the frame with its cylinder banks rotated about 7 degrees rearward from the Sabre layout to shorten the wheelbase. Fuel and air were supplied by four 32mm carburetors and it featured a sprag or slipper clutch to soften the engine braking, a first for production bikes. The Interceptor engine produced 86 horsepower and a peak torque of 46.3 pounds-feet. This was more powerful than that of the Magna and Sabre thanks to different cam profiles, improvements to the airbox, and the use of air induction as developed for the NR500. The Interceptor had a chain drive and a 5-speed transmission, down from 6 speeds in the Magna and Sabre to make room for the chain drive and the rearward tilt of the cylinder bags. The Interceptor was the first production bike to have a double cradle perimeter frame made from rectangular section steel tubing. This frame was very sturdy, albeit heavy, and it had a section that could be taken out for engine removal. The Interceptor had Comcast alloy wheels and like the FWS 1000, a production first 16 inch wheel on front, tucked in close to the chassis thanks to split radiators, shortening the wheelbase for better handling. It had Honda's Prolink rear suspension with an air adjustable Showa shock and a hollow aluminum sandcast swing arm. Up front were air-adjustable 39mm Showa forks fitted with Honda's new track anti-dive system. Front and rear suspension had adjustable rebound damping. Brakes were two floating discs at the front and one at the rear, all with two piston calipers. According to Mike Spencer, the choice of a half fairing design over the smaller cockpit fairing was a subject of much debate. The larger fairing was chosen because it improved the bike's stability and handling at higher speeds. And hence, the distinctive look of the Interceptor was defined. With Yamaha's strong sales projections, 
Honda wasn't solely focused on making a homologation special at this time. Of the 56 motorcycles and ATVs in their 1983 lineup, 16 were new and 10 of the new ones were street bikes. When this model range was unveiled at their 1982 dealer meeting, the V65 Magna stole the show. Marketed as the world's fastest production bike, it caught everyone's attention. With that and all the noise of the other new bikes in the 1983 lineup, most Honda dealers didn't recognize the significance of the Interceptor. On the other hand, motorcycle magazine editors took quick notice of Honda's new V4 Sport bike. It was named Motorcycle of the Year by Motorcyclist Magazine and Cycle Guide. Cycle World ran a 750 class shootout in its May 1983 issue, with the Interceptor the clear winner for being the quickest, fastest and most powerful of the class. Cycle Magazine wrote, as a sport bike, the Interceptor is nearly perfect. Contrary to expectations for a homologation special, the VF750F was a sellout success, surprising marketers who had underestimated its appeal. With a half fairing and chin fairing, the exposed perimeter frame and the racing-like petcock on the side of the fuel tank, its striking design stood out from other bikes of the day. But this bike wasn't all about looks. Its usable power, advanced suspension, strong brakes, responsive handling and cutting edge technology fulfilled Honda's goal to build a dominant race bike. In their first AMA Superbike appearance, the opening event of the 1983 season at Daytona, Interceptors finished in the top three spots. Fred Merkel would go on to win the AMA series title in 1984 and 1985 on a factory Interceptor. However, the production Interceptor had its downsides. Its weight of 248 kilograms made it almost 10 kilograms heavier than the Kawasaki GPZ750. Some riders also complained that the Interceptor had a vague and disconnected feel during aggressive riding. But the Interceptor's biggest problem was premature camshaft wear, an issue that afflicted some of Honda's other early production V4s. The cause was first thought to be inadequate oil flow, which Honda tried to solve with service bulletins for minor after-sale fixes. This didn't solve the problem, and they eventually figured out the cause was excess movement of the camshafts in their bores through the cam towers and caps, with the fix being the installation of modified camshafts. However, the damage to Honda's early V4's image was already done. It really never recovered until Honda switched to gear-driven cams with the 1986 VFR750. Despite its downsides, the original Interceptor left a lasting impact. Its success on racetracks and in showrooms, its innovative features, its usable power, its unmatched handling, and its striking appearance set a new standard for production sport bikes and racing bikes. Unsurprisingly, the other Japanese manufacturers responded quickly. Kawasaki unveiled the Ninja 900 in 1984, followed in 1985 by Yamaha's 5-valve FZ750 and Suzuki's lightweight GSXR 750. Capitalizing on the success of the 750 Interceptor, Honda added 500cc and 1000cc versions in 1984. Honda pushed its V4 racing program forward with much success. The RS850R, derived from the Interceptor, took Joey Dunlop to a dominant victory in the Formula One class of the 1983 Isle of Man TT. It evolved to the RS930R, which with 140 horsepower and a top speed of 275 kilometers per hour, was the ultimate expression of the Interceptor's racing potential. In 1984 came the 120 horsepower RS750R, an Interceptor derivative which won the 24 hours of Le Mans. And in 1987 came the double World Superbike Championship winning V4 RC30, also known as the VFR750R, which could trace its roots back to the original Interceptor. On the production side, the VFR750F was introduced in 1986 as the first full upgrade to the Interceptor. Its gear-driven camshafts had none of the top-end flaws suffered by the previous generation. It also featured a box aluminum frame and significant improvements over the VF750F all around. The VFR series became a staple sport tourer in Honda's line, 
continuing on in various forms until 2021. The first interceptor shook the motorcycle world. Its innovations brought about a step change in the design of racing and production sport bikes. It stands out as a milestone in Honda's history, its influence showing in their long line of successful V4 motorcycles that followed. It's always said that competition is healthy, and the proof is in the Interceptor, Honda's reaction to a wake-up call from Yamaha. Honda responded with an out-of-the-box design to build a motorcycle that was clearly a step ahead of everything else in its day. It's fair to say that the original Interceptor was the bike that put Honda back on top. Thanks for watching.